So wait, we're drawing diagrams in this video? Boring. Exactly. That's right, today we're talking about diagrams. Hit the theme. Ain't nothing but a chem thing, baby. Too flipped out, teachers going crazy. Lancaster is a district that pays me. Unbreakable, so please don't try to break this. But uh, back to the lecture at hand. Hello and welcome to another episode of Shu Fu Chem and Asha. I'm your host Fu and with me as always is Shu. Shu know it. So in today's episode, we're gonna focus back on the Bohr model. And even though it's not the modern model, there's a lot of things about the Bohr model that are pretty convenient in terms of keeping track of electrons. So let's get started. Atomic Skills Part 3, EMR and the Atom, a lesson from the Atomic Theory Unit. Bohr Electron Configurations. We can use the Bohr model of the atom to show how electrons are filled up in each energy level. This involves using your periodic table. Each number represents the total number of electrons in that energy level. So in the image below, we brought up the key from your periodic table again. If you look in the lower left-hand corner of every element box and in this key, you'll see it's labeled electron configuration. Now carbon's electron configuration is 2-4. That first two means there are two electrons in the first energy level, and the four means there are four electrons in the second energy level. Let's take a look at how electrons fill up an atom. The first energy level is filled with two electrons. If we move to the second energy level, it would be full with a configuration of 2-8. Two, 2 in the first, 8 in the second. Moving on to 3, we have 2-8-8, eight, eight, and we begin to fill up the fourth energy level as 2-8-8-2. Two, eight, eight, two. But it's a little bit strange here, we're actually not done filling up the third energy level. We start filling the fourth with 2, and then we go back and we finish filling the third with a total of 18. So now we're 2, 8, 18, 2. We continue on filling up the fourth energy level at 2, 8, 18, 8, and we can continue on from there. But this gives you a general idea of how the energy levels are filled. You try number one. What is the Bohr electron configuration of strontium? You're gonna to need to take out your periodic tables because you're gonna need them for this practice problem and throughout the rest of the lesson. Excited states. When electrons are promoted to higher energy levels, their electron configurations change. While we cannot promote lower energy level electrons to higher energy levels that are already full, we can promote lower energy level electrons to empty energy levels or energy levels that are not completely filled. All right, we're gonna do an example here and we're gonna ask you to follow along. Shu, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so we've got the element, and we've got a Bohr electron configuration in the ground state we want to find, and then we want to give some examples of what some excited state Bohr electron configurations would look like, okay? Okay. All right, so the element we're dealing with here is sodium. Okay, so where do I find the Bohr electron configuration for sodium in the ground state? Well, I think that if I find the electron configuration listed for sodium on the periodic table, that that would automatically mean it's in the ground state. That is correct. Okay, so for sodium, it says on the periodic table, two, eight, one. Good, and it's good to know that every element has only one ground state electron configuration. Okay. All right, so what does it mean for an element to be in the excited state? All right, so I have to promote an electron from low energy to high energy. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna try one. So maybe I move one from the second to the third. Okay. And I go two, seven, two. That's perfect. That is a good example of an excited state electron configuration. Okay. Um, could I move one from the first to the second and make one, nine, one. All right, well that does have 11 electrons, but there is one issue here, and it has to do with the second energy level. How many is the most that that can hold? Oh, earlier we were saying that it's filled with eight electrons in the yeah, second Yeah, so we can only have eight there. So this is one of those things that we don't want to end up doing is putting too many in. Okay, so we can't overfill. Let me try a different one then. Can I move an electron from the third energy level to like an empty fourth energy level? Absolutely. Two, two, two. 
Um, we'll go eight, zero, one. That works. Okay. I'm feeling a little more creative now. Can I move more than one electron at a time? You sure can. All right, so I'm gonna go uh, two, six, three. And how about zero, eight, three? Do those all work? Those both work. Okay. Um, can I, can I like have extra electrons? Like maybe two, eight, two? There's an extra electron in the third energy level. All right, so that wouldn't show an electron being promoted because the initial ground state was 2, 8, 1, and you still have those 2 in the first, the 8 in the second. There still is that 1 in the third. All you've done is added one. So you haven't made an excited state. You just added an electron. Okay, so I want to make sure I avoid doing that. Correct. So this is a pretty good list, right, of those different excited states? You try number two. Use your reference tables and figure out the Bohr electron configuration in the ground state and give at least three examples of excited state electron configurations for the element oxygen. Bohr diagrams. We can more visually represent the subatomic particles in the atom using a Bohr diagram. We draw an atom by labeling the correct number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Then we use the electron configuration to label the electrons in the appropriate energy levels. Let's take a look at an example of a Bohr diagram. Are we ready, Fu? We are. All right. Draw the Bohr diagram for sodium 23. All right. So we're going to start with our nucleus. Let's draw a big circle to represent our nucleus. Big circle for a nucleus. And we're going to list the number of protons and neutrons in this nucleus. So let's start with the protons. How many protons does sodium have? And tell me how you knew it. All right, well, sodium has 11 protons. And I knew it because a wise man once told me, if you're not using your reference tables, you're doing it wrong. Very true, very true. So that's 11 protons. Very good. All right, how are we gonna figure out the number of neutrons in this particular isotope of sodium? All right, well, we've already learned this, right? So mass number minus atomic number right, always gives me the number of neutrons. So the mass number here in the problem is 23. They give that to me right there. Um, and I already know the protons are 11, so 23 minus 11 is 12. So 12 neutrons. Very good. Now we're gonna take a look at the electron configuration for sodium. So again, using your reference tables, what is its electron configuration? So it shows me that it's two, eight, one on my reference tables. All right, now we're gonna represent that visually. Uh, you may have done a version where you drew full circles and actually drew circles for all the electrons in those shells. We're gonna kind of use partial arcs to represent all the rings okay. and just label the number of electrons with numbers and not draw out actual circles for each electron. Okay, so I've got three numbers, so that means three energy levels, right? Yep. So that's three arcs. Good. And the first one has two electrons. The second one has eight electrons, and the last one only has one electron. And that's it. That's the Bohr diagram for sodium-23. You try number three. Draw a Bohr diagram for oxygen-16. Valence electrons. Valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level. They are far away from the attraction of the nucleus, and they are thus the most loosely held electrons. Because of this, they participate in chemical reactions. All other electrons are called the core or kernel electrons. All right, so we're gonna do an example of how to figure out how to get valence electrons. Shu, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, how many valence electrons does germanium have? Okay, so we need to look up germanium on our periodic table and find its Bohr electron configuration. Okay, so germanium is GE. And right off of the periodic table, it says 2, 8, 18, and 4. All right. So since it's off of the periodic table, we know that this is in the ground state. So which ones of those electrons are our outermost or valence electrons? Okay. So all these ones are kind of those inner core electrons, so not those. So what's left in the last shell would be four valence electrons. That's correct. It's easy as that. You try number four. How many kernel electrons does bromine have? Lewis dot diagrams. We can represent the valence electrons with dots around the element symbol. 
fill in electrons around the atom in the following order. So when drawing Lewis dot diagrams, it's important to remember the order in which we fill in the dots. Now I want you to think of the element symbol as a square that has a top, a bottom, a left, and a right. So for an element that only has one valence electron, we're gonna put that dot on the top. If it has two electrons, we're gonna put that second one also on the top. We pair them up right away. Now we're gonna progress in a clockwise motion around our square. So the third electron goes on the right. Now the fourth one is gonna actually go on the bottom. It's not gonna pair up with the third one. And we're gonna talk about that a little while later. Now the fifth electron goes on the left. So then when we hit our sixth, seventh, and eighth, now we start to pair those electrons back up. So the sixth will pair up on the right, the seventh will pair up on the bottom, and the eighth will pair up on the left. All right, so we're gonna do an example of how to draw a Lewis dot diagram. Shu, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, let's draw a Lewis dot diagram for nitrogen. So the first thing we have to do is look up nitrogen on our periodic table. Okay, so nitrogen is N. I'm gonna start with the N. All right, so what do the dots represent in a Lewis dot diagram? They represent the valence electrons. Okay, and what are the valence electrons for nitrogen? Um, it looks like in the last shell for nitrogen, there are five valence electrons. There are. So we should have a total of five dots. Now let's figure out where they go. Okay, so you said to think of the element as sort of a box. So I'm going to start on the top of the box. So I know I'm going to start out with the first two on top. Good. Those first two always get paired up. Now I'm over on the right hand side of the box. And so I'm going to put my third electron here. And then I kind of get confused. Does the fourth electron go right below it paired up or not? No, it does not. Remember, the third gets on the right. The fourth does not pair up yet. Again, we'll talk about why a little bit later. So sort of like I'm skipping that spot, moving down to the bottom, putting that there. Yep. And then I'm assuming that for that last electron, the fifth one, that it also will not pair up, move over to the left-hand side of the box. That's correct. And so now I have my five valence electrons on nitrogen. Perfect. You try number five. Draw a Lewis dot diagram for chlorine. Well, that's gonna do it for today's episode on diagrams. It's been emotional. Today's episode is brought to you by... Raw Toast. But we never off, or we zone to the break of dawn. S E I E N C E in the hall, they call S Wing. You know we never wear a tie like my homies, boys, two men. It's so hard to say goodbye. Like, like this, that, and this, and uh, it's like that, and like this, and like that, and uh, it's like this. You're going in low power mode. Plug in, chill to the next episode.